Thank you, Pastor Steve. It's truly an honor and joy for me to be here with you this morning. Um, as I said in the first service, the choir just got better, and so did the praise team. So grateful for the way they praise the Lord and blessing us here this morning as we ready our hearts for his word to be proclaimed to us. Pastor Steve is someone that I've respected from afar for many years, and for me to come and join you in this worship is high honor, especially given the fact that my wife, many years ago, nearly two decades ago, was a member here as well, uh, and, and attending and serving this church. So in many ways, this is coming back home for both of us, for us to worship with you and spend some time with you as well. I want to bring you greetings from Westminster Seminary, California, perhaps an institution that not all of you know very intimately. We are in Escondido in San Diego County, uh, so we're about uh, 90 miles away from here. And the seminary is trying her best to serve the Lord faithfully by exalting the name of Jesus Christ as you have done so faithfully here. We covet your prayers as we go through some transitions. I'm in my new position for all of 11 weeks or so, uh, which means that when people ask me, how are you doing with that concern look that many people have, I have no idea. I think I'm doing just fine. When you're starting a new job, you're figuring things out. But as many friends and family members are praying for us, we are encouraged and we gain confidence from your prayers. So thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for praying for us as well. And we desire that we may continue to serve the Lord together in partnership. This morning, I want to ask you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Hear now the word of the Lord. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who, sh um, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor uh, rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we turn to the Lord in prayer? Father, on this day, when we celebrate the birthday of this church, as well as the beginnings of the Reformation, we give thanks to you because the main figure in these events are not us, but it's you and you alone. Thank you for being our Father, God in heaven, who is at work among us, blessing this church living hope so that it too can be a living hope to many others who hear the gospel being proclaimed so faithfully in this pulpit. We thank you for many men and women as well as churches, O oh Lord, who sacrifice so much so that the church may be built. Even as we sit in 2017, O oh Lord, we recognize that you are indeed master over all history. As you gather us into your home this morning, O oh Lord, open our ears so that we may hear your voice directly as our discipler. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, so that we may receive these things, not simply as intellectual challenges and discussions, but, Lord, that these things will transform and change us for your glory and for your church. For we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul begins by asking the question in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? Now, these things that he refers to may refer to the immediate verse preceding it in verse 30, 30 when he says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This indeed is a wonderful summary of Paul's teaching, often referred to as the golden chain. 
But what Paul has in mind, it seems to me, is something broader and more general and more encompassing that, than that particular verse in verse 30. What he has in mind is what he's been teaching throughout the book of Romans. And at the heart of this letter, written to a church that he's never visited before, is this question, how can sinners like you and I be right with God who is perfect and righteous? How can sinners like you and I receive mercy and grace from our Father in heaven? Romans teaches us how we can receive this righteousness from God. In chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul reminds us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None can come before God and claim righteousness before him because all of us are fallible individuals who have sinned before the perfect and righteous God. But that's not where the story ends. Chapter 3, verse 21, all the way till the end of chapter 5 in verse 21, we are told that God had a solution for our sin problem. This sin problem, solution of it was not found in and of ourselves because our inclination is towards sin, but it comes from outside of us, from God himself who sends his son Jesus Christ so that Christ might die on our behalf, that by his living and dying and resurrecting, that we might be cleansed of our sins and receive the right standing before the sight of God. Chapter 6 of Romans begins then, if we are saved by grace alone, we continue to be sanctified. That is, we become more and more like God, being transformed into his likeness, not according to our good works or how much efforts we put into our change, but because God is at work and he changes us. No wonder Martin Luther, whose name is most closely associated with the Reformation five centuries ago, talks about Romans this way when he says that the book of Romans is really the chief part of the New Testament and truly the purest gospel. He says further, it is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. This daily bread of the soul we want to turn to this morning with the question that Paul has been raising thus far. And this question he begins with our section when he says, what then shall we say in response to these things that he's taught previously? Paul is asking his readers to react to what he said. He's not satisfied in having expounded the greatest knowledge of theology, but as their pastor, As a preacher, he wants his readers to understand what this means to them. And he does this by asking us four unanswerable questions. Not that there are no answers to these questions, but these answers are so obvious to us. You and and I would know without actually being told what the proper answer should be. And he begins by asking us in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, if Paul had said simply, who can be against us, perhaps many of us can draw up numerous answers. One only needs to look at verse 35 alone to list out a catalog of hardships that many of us see right around us and perhaps experience daily in ourselves. He talks about tribulation. He talks about distress. He talks about persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. However, the essence of the question is in the if clause of the conditional. There is no doubt in Paul's mind that God is indeed for us. Perhaps we might be able to translate this phrase by saying, since, since God is for us, who can be against us? Since God is for us, who can be against us? Who is this God? Lots of answers can be given. But perhaps one thing that he's been reminding us of over and over again in the book of Romans, especially in this beautiful chapter of chapter 8, is that he testifies to the fact that God is our Father in heaven. This is why he says in chapter 8, verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And every verse from verse 14 through 17 remind us that we are now adopted into the family of God. Verse 14 says sons of God. 15 says as sons. 16 says children of God. Verse 17 says children. 
This is so different than how Paul referred to those outside of Christ previously when he referred to us who continue to live in sin apart from Christ as weak, ungodly sinners. But now because of Christ, we are sons and daughters of God and he is for us. You know what it means practically that we are sons and daughters of God? That this means that those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior belong to him. That those of us who can confess his name belong to our God, our Father in heaven. And this is important for us. Because your value and your significance is based on the very fact that you belong to him. To put it another way, God doesn't love you because you are valuable, but you are valuable. You are made valuable because you are loved by God. The world says that you are valuable because of your successes, experience, perhaps letters behind your name. But God says that you're valuable simply because you belong to him in Christ Jesus, our Lord. About a year ago, I did something that I plan on doing about six months from now, which is to be glued to the TV watching a spectacle, a world spectacle that we don't care about for three years and 50 weeks. It's called the Olympics. We were watching sports and events that you and I don't care at all about for the rest of the time, such as 10-meter platform diving. Things that we would tell children not to do, but we love seeing others to doing it. And what makes it even more interesting is that someone decided at one point that 10-meter platform diving was not scary enough. So they decided to create a category called synchronized 10-meter platform diving. This is where two people together in motion fall down 10 meters is the goal that they have. I don't know if you knew this or not, but an American duo actually won silver. David Badaya and Steele Johnson are their names. When afterwards, NBC, representing the world, interviewed these two athletes, this is what they said. They asked him, how did you handle the stress and the pressure of what you're doing? And David said, it's just an identity crisis. When my mind is on this diving and I'm thinking I'm defined by this, then my mind goes crazy. But we both know that our identity is in Christ. And we're thankful for this opportunity to be able to dive in front of Brazil and in front of the United States. It's been an absolutely thrilling moment for us. This is actually great theology from an athlete. It's not just simply pointing your finger up in heaven as if that's supposed to define what your theology is all about. He identifies himself with Jesus Christ. What's more amazing is that this was broadcast throughout the world. The lady interviewing him, I think, was slightly uncomfortable because she immediately turned her microphone to his partner, Steele Johnson, and asked him the same. And this is what Steele said. The way David just described it was flawless. <laughs> the fact that I was going into this event knowing that my identity is rooted in Christ and not what the result of this competition is just gave me peace and it let me enjoy the contest. I hope there are many athletes here who become super athletes so that you have an opportunity to confess where you have your ability from. This is the person to whom you belong. Do you know who God is? He is your Father in heaven because of Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul says, he is for you. He's got your back, is what it said. And here, if God is for us, who can be against us? No one and nothing. But this is just the beginning of his application because the second question is verse 32 when he says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Again, Paul did not ask the question, Will God not graciously give us everything we ask for? We could have said that there are many things that God did not provide, perhaps list of things that we prayed about that we have not received. At best, this is an equivocal answer. But notice what Paul does. He first points out the costliness of our redemption. He who did not spare his own son. Romans 3 reminds us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement 
propitiation through faith in his blood. That is, in saving us, God went to the limit. Could God have done anything extra for us? We cannot imagine nor know the pain felt by the Father and Jesus at Calvary upon the cross. Yet we can say this. If the measure of love is what it gives, then there never was such a love as God showed to sinners at Calvary, and there never will be. The first part of this verse makes the question he asks possible. That is, arguing from greater to the lesser, Paul argues that all things will be given. Having given his son for you and I, everything else pales in comparison in spite of our protests. That for our eternal destiny, our God is saying, and he's promising to us, he will one day bring us home. He who began a good work in us will bring it to its completion. But not only will we get to that day when we'll see him without a veil, we recognize that what we need in this journey of life, this pilgrim, the Lord will provide. He who did not spare his own son, he will provide the rest which are so small in comparison. I told you that my wife and I have two kids, Simeon and Anna. Anna is 12, Simeon is 10. They're named after the individuals who recognize Jesus, who are presented at the temple even before the world knowing. That is one day we hope and pray that our children too will recognize Jesus and be able to proclaim his name as his witnesses. Sharon and I are not perfect parents, but we try our best and we try to provide for them. We do things like this. We give them housing without ever charging them. Uh, they have their own rooms, they have beds, We've never, ever discussed how much lodging they should pay. We've also fed them three meals a day, every single day. There are certain days where we missed here and there, but we fed them every single day, three meals a day, and we've never charged them, not once, not once. We're also their Uber and taxi. We drive them everywhere. They don't even have credit cards to pay us with, but we take them anyways. And oftentimes, their schedule is more busy than ours. And when they point out that their friends have things that they don't have, we as parents remind them they can't have everything they ask for, but it hits us right here. And so we remember these things, and we look for an occasion like their birthdays or Christmas to actually buy them what they want so that they can play with them for about two or three days and destroy them <laughs> afterwards. This is what parents do. All the parents here do this. And all those of you who are not parents yet, this is what your parents do. You're welcome for letting you know. My kids, therefore, should be saying to me, thank you always. You're the best dad and mom ever. Or they should be singing our praises saying, I cannot believe you sacrifice so much for us every single day. Let us do something for you, said no children ever. <laughs> we don't know what it is. And we were children once too. We identify with that completely. The reason I mention that, however, is that before God, we're the same. We are like that 2, 3, 4, 10, 12, 15, 30-year-old children who stand before God having received his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Yet, our lips are not full of thanksgiving and praises, are often full of complaints and needs or wants. This is exactly who we are. This is why Paul turns to us and says, he who did not spare his own son, he reminds us. Why will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. He will provide. He will provide. But the question's not done. There's a third question, verse 33. He says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Now, Paul does not for a moment deny that Christians fail and fall, sometimes in serious ways. In fact, the second half of Romans 7 reminds us of our condition where he says, the good that I want to do, I don't do, and the bad that I don't want to do, I keep on doing, he says. He also does not deny that there are many who love to accuse us. I'm sure many of us can name several. Our conscience accuses us. 
The devil never ceases to accuse. As you know, the word behind the word devil actually means a slanderer. And we doubtless have many human friends and those who seemingly are friends who are bringing charges against us, delighting in pointing their fingers at us for our faults and our shortcomings. But Paul emphatically denies that any lapses now that you and I have can endanger our status we have before God because of Jesus Christ our Lord. Being adopted into the family of God is not a provisional nor a temporary thing. Our status as being righteous before God because of Jesus Christ cannot and does not change. And the reason is simple. It's a courtroom drama where there is only one who stands as the supreme judge of our eternal destiny. And that is God himself. He has declared in the Son our verdict and no one can review that verdict. As Pastor Steve brought up, one of the central issues of the Reformation was the discussion of how we are saved. That is, how are we made righteous before the sight of God? Our status before God is not determined according to the Reformation, according to what we do or our works. For we have nothing in our hands that we can bring before God that meets up to his righteous and perfect standards. Our living well as good as that may be, our gifts, as prices, pricey as they may be, pale in comparison to the perfection needed for us to stand before God right and righteous. The, thus, the Reformation's recovery from the medieval period of only by faith, that is what we come before the throne of God, not believing in ourselves, but believing and trusting in Jesus Christ alone by faith for our salvation, here, therefore, we have peace with God. This is why Romans 5 is able to say, therefore, since we have been justified by what? Through faith, Paul tells us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We remember October 31st, for this, because on October 31st, 1517, a professor named Martin Luther, who himself was a Roman Catholic at the time, who was teaching through the book of Romans, where he came to realize this truth to be rediscovered, actually posted what they call the 95 Thesis on the wooden door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. The wooden door was used because that's where many of the announcements were made. And many historians now look back upon that day as the day when the Reformation began. Reformation not because we're reinventing the church, but going back upon the teachings of Scripture where we recognize that God is sovereign over everything, but not just about life, including our salvation from the thought that somehow we could save ourselves by doing good things. As uh, Martin Luther points out, he was himself a monk. He says, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I, he said. He prayed hard. He was a practicing ascetic. ascetic. He was uh, committed to celibacy. He was committed to many of these things that many consider to be good things that are acceptable before the sight of God. But he never had peace. He never had the confidence that the Lord had accepted him. His fear was immense, terrifying judge sitting over him. And the question he kept asking over and over again was, how can a man be right with God? And this is what he said, I grasp the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and by sheer mercy, undeserved and unearned, he justifies us. He makes us right before God by faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. This teaching of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. This is why we remember this. Historical remembrances are not just fanciful things that we have because we think it's nice. But we remember these things because the Lord used human instruments to teach and to change and to reform us. 
and the Reformation began what we now refer to as the Protestant church, which was indeed initially a pejorative phrase. You're protesting against the church at the present time. And here we now stand with prayers before God for ongoing Reformation, that all of us here and the generations to come will recognize that our salvation is not by what we do, but what God has done in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we hold on to it with faith and faith alone. No one can change that because it's not our doing. God has done it, and he is a promise-keeping God. Which leads us to the final question. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Human way of understanding love is oftentimes conditional. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. It's ever-changing. What you love today can change tomorrow and the day after. And it's incredibly self-focused. It's about our own gain. But God's love for us is unconditional and sacrificial and unchanging. Twice he mentions the love of God in Christ Jesus in verse 35 and 39, repeating for us the demonstration of his love in Romans 5 when he said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, that is, we weren't clamoring for God, we weren't thinking we needed God, we weren't being repentant, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Paul says. This is important to us because Paul was a realist who understood pain and sufferings. He's not one of those individuals who taught that just because you call upon Jesus as your Lord, that wealth and health will follow you. In fact, he makes it very clear that on this side of glory, in this human pilgrimage until we get to our eternal home, it will be marked By pain, as he says in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, on this side of glory, all of creation is marked by suffering, futility, bondage, all resulting from sin. Suffering is all around us, whether from weak and weakening bodies, broken relationships and families, constant natural disasters we've heard a lot about recently, especially the hurricanes, Struggles through daily uncertainties as we think about our schools and our work and our futures. We daily realize that this is not our home. And that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. As he says in verse 28, we live in weakness. We live in weakness. In place of order, we have disorder and rebellion. In place of peace, we have discord and brokenness. In place of health, we experience pain and illness. In place of life, we daily experience death. And this is where Paul is driving the point home when he says, can the sufferings and weaknesses of this life separate us from the love of Christ? His answer is, an emphatic, no. Paul dares to argue that not only will we overcome them, but that we will triumph over these predicaments of life. We are more than conquerors. But here's the catch. This is not our own doing as if we're holding on tight to God. No, it's God who's holding on tight to us. Forgive me for such a human example to tell of something that is so spiritual, but we went on our first cruise when my younger child was about two, one and a half, almost two. And one of the things that as parents we were concerned about was keeping him together so that he doesn't go over the edge of the ship. I know that sounds uh, unreasonable to many, but we had those fears And so what we decided to do was to do things that I, as a single person, hated seeing married people do. That is, when I was single, I was more of an expert about child rearing until I had kids. And what we used was this backpack that to a child looks beautiful, but it has a tail on the back that parents hold on to. We leashed him. It's about 10 foot long. He could roam around as much as he can. And there are times when we're in a crowd, he can roam away that when he turns around, he doesn't see us. And then there are times when he's close next to us that we know he's right there. Back and forth, back and forth he went. 
One thing we do know is that as parents, we were in charge because we we're holding on to that line. That line cannot be cut. As a child, however, there are moments when he looked back and seemed like the parents weren't near. But the problem is not God holding your leash that's unbroken. The problem is our perception. As we do not see him with our earthly eyes, we do not hear him with our earthly ears. He has never departed. Because in Christ Jesus our Lord, Christ Jesus our Lord connects us to our Father in heaven in such a way, nothing can separate us. This is the point that he wants to bring home when he says in verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am sure, not perhapses, not maybes, not laters, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth. And just in case, there are clever people here who might say, Paul, you missed a few things here. He says in a bucket category, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate us from the love of Christ and cut us off from his love? Nothing. No circumstance, no person can separate us from the love of God for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our fathers and mothers of faith five centuries ago when the Reformation began, they wrote down their faith in a codified form called the Confessions and Catechisms. One of the catechisms they wrote, which is a question and answer form of teaching children, was called the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, written around the 1560s. And this was the summary of the faith of many who precede us in the Protestant church. And this is the question that they ask and answer they give. What is your only comfort in life and in death? What is your only comfort in life and in death? The answer begins by saying that I am not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That is, that we are not our own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Congratulations, Living Hope, for the Lord has sustained you for 24 years to be a beacon of light a church where Christ's name is singularly exalted each and every single Sunday as you live out your lives for Christ. Congratulations, O oh brothers and sisters in Christ, for the Lord has been so kind and gracious to us, faithful in his provisions, that he has sustained his church for centuries so that we can see and look at the Lord uh, and say the Lord is great, for he has been good to us. May the Lord bless Pastor Steve and the staff and leadership of this church. May the Lord bless you as a wonderful body of Christ representing Brea and its environs. May you may continue to be faithful to him, exalting his name, for he surely will be faithful to you. May the Lord grant to us backbones of steel in these changing environment and times so that as our forefathers and mothers have proclaimed in the past, that we will for centuries to come, that indeed our trust is in Christ alone, that our salvation comes by our faith alone, and that we lean upon his grace alone for our life, for our eternal destiny, and for his glory's sake, that we as individuals and as church live our lives for his glory and for his honor's sake. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer.